Hello, good afternoon. It's afternoon in India. Uh, welcome to everybody who has joined us from different parts of the world. Thanks for taking time with out to be with us. You know, on a Monday. My name is Alokesh. I'm senior editor with the Economic Times. I welcome you to this discussion on resuming India's inclusive growth strategy at the Horasis India meeting 2020. Today, I have the honor of uh, chairing a distinguished panel. So let me just uh, introduce you to the panelists uh, initially. Uh, we have Alok Chaturvedi, who's the professor in Purdue University's Cranard Graduate School of Management and Department of Computer Sciences. He's also the founder, chairman, and CEO of Simulexing, which is a modeling and simulation company located in Purdue Technology Park. He is the technical lead for the US Department of Defense's Sentient World Simulation Project. That's Alok for you. Hello. So we have Bill Guen, who is the founder and CEO of ABS Institute in Vietnam. Bill has over 15 years experience of business management. He's also associate professor of finance at UVS University and an editorial review board member of the Journal of American Academic Research. We have Sandeep Kulati. Sandeep is the serial, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's the founder and CEO of Biologic Corp in the USA. Sandeep is working on nanoscale biosensors for aerosolized coronavirus detection, detection in crowded indoor shared spaces. So very critical today, you know, like uh, airplanes and hospitals. And he has led and globally collaborated on hard science problems in aerospace, public safety, remote sensing, life sciences, and medical applications for more than 30 years at NASA and multiple startups. We have uh, Murli Bukapatnam. Murli is also a serial entrepreneur. He's today the chairman of Voxy Technologies. He now focuses his efforts on the Skilling Company, which is a workforce development company based out of Hyderabad. Uh, the company enables unemployed youth with boot camp model and captive employment. He's also one of the founded partners of the National Skill Development Corporation. And finally, we have Nandkishore Hari Kumar. Nandkishore is the CEO and founder of cybersecurity startup Technisanct. Nand Kishore is an engineer turned entrepreneur. His startup is backed by IIT Mundi, Data Security Council of India, India Accelerator Program, and Global Accelerator Network. Thank you all, gentlemen, for joining us uh, in this debate today. I welcome all of you and welcome to all our audience as well. I'll just set a short context because we don't have much time. So, we'll a short context from me and then we'll uh, dive into the discussion straight away. You know, the COVID 19 pandemic. As we all know, it's a once in a century kind of phenomenon, but uh, that does not give us any relief. You know, once in a century means we should not relax. It's quite the opposite, actually. Uh, COVID-19 is not only taking lives uh, literally, but it is also striking at livelihoods, you know, uh, of a large chunk of the world's population. The most impacted are the poor. Uh, the pandemic's impact, you know, it continues. It's not, it's not got over. It's far from over. You know, we have no clue where the sea floor is and how long it will take us to get back to the surface. It just continues to strike deeper and deeper. You know, India's GDP growth, it looks set to provide the worst performance outlook in a very long time. You know, the State Bank of India has predicted a contraction of 6.8% in FY21. Others such as Crystal, Goldman Sachs, Nomura are expecting contraction of 5%. And there are many others who are expecting pretty much similar kind of uh, fall in performance. As much as 10% of the GDP in real terms could be permanently lost, some experts feel. That's quite scary, isn't it? So the point is, when the GDP growth is plummeting like that, like a stone, you know, why are we sitting here and talking about inclusive growth? Uh, especially at a time, you know, when the poor and the marginalized are facing a lot of challenges. You know, some of them seem to be insurmountable, you know, in making their ends meet, taking care of their health. In some cases in India, we have seen what challenges they have faced in actually even reaching home, right? So it's a major crisis. But so why we are we talking about inclusive growth when there are bigger problems at play? Actually, we should all be talking about inclusive growth because without inclusive, equitable growth, you know, societies would hit for chaos and economic growth can only be sustained if there is strong, equitable growth, uh, you know, in an inclusive manner. So the bigger question that we have to uh, debate here is has COVID-19, you know, set inclusive growth in India and other parts of the world back as it set us back by years and decades, or is there some light at the end of this dark tunnel? And uh, we are fortunate to have with us here today people, you know, panelists from Vietnam and from the USA and from India. So we will look at we'll look at 
generally broadly and also into these countries to see what lessons are there for each other <clears throat> so i'll start with uh, you know uh, opening thoughts i would invite all the panelists to give opening thoughts you know let's keep them short please and you know like uh, we discussed in the pre panel uh, debate we should keep this uh, interactive but uh, first two minutes opening sh uh, shots from everybody we'll start with you alok uh, thank you and it's a it's a pleasure to join this uh, august group here on this panel so uh, good afternoon everybody in india and good morning to everybody in us and uh, uh, so you know covid has created a real opportunity for it for everyone i'm an eternal optimist so I, i look at it as an opportunity so uh you know what covid has done it has reset the world economy and by setting the re resetting the world economy means that you know we have an opportunity to redesign the way we have been doing things in the past so we have to get away from the standard uh, consumption based economy which was created by by the western models and so these models essentially has deteriorated into something like you know people produce to produce and pollute exploit and profit consume and waste uh, loot and scoot so these have been the models which has been widely used and it has really created a huge gap between the rich and the and and the rest uh so what has been happening the trends have been that in the last 5 to 7 years even in the us there has been a lot of repatriation of manufacturing jobs coming back to to insurers uh so when the glo globalization was at its peak even in the united states uh, 50000 plant closures happened since uh, the turn of the century and over 5 million jobs were lost so this has created a huge disparity and uh, especially in the midwest so something different had to be done and so so i as uh, started an institute at purdue university it's called institute for social empowerment through entrepreneurship and knowledge and the idea there is how we can get into this inclusive uh, 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 entrepreneurship and this inclusive entrepreneurship has to be very different so if you look at entrepreneurship uh there are different layers of entrepreneurship and in india we are primarily i mean india is an entrepreneurial country and uh, the number of organized jobs are much less so at the lowest level the entrepreneurship is livelihood based then above that there's skills based then above that there is needs based and then comes the the more traditional entrepreneurship which we talk in the west and so those are knowledge based and then obviously certain path breaking entrepreneurship so so during the discussion we'll go more over that but the concept here is that how can you use a platform or platform based inclusive entrepreneurship and by creating that platform and again i'll, I'll talk more about that platform based based entrepreneurship so how can you make it inclusive how can you bring in people who have been left behind to create a situation where it is a lot easier for them to to start a new company and then become a part of the global economy so i'll stop there and and then you know, you know we'll continue our, our discussion right. on these concepts thanks a lot in fact we'll come back to you on the platform based model you know it uh, sounds interesting i'll come to bill now bill given from vietnam uh, your opening comments please hello uh, this is bill nguyen um, i'm from uh, vietnam and um And, and we see how the uh, government manage inclusive growth in Vietnam. They get they manage via the policy. If they want the uh, policy, any provinces improve the GDP, and then they they set the on the raising up that raising uh, provinces that you can offer zero tax income. So invite the foreign investor there come there for a simple timing problems they invite Samsung corporation more than factory here invest 7 billion US dollar over there to of to have job for the people over there for what because in the uh, rough timing problems in the mountain area 
people some people do self trust or something like that so in order to improve that errors they invite samsung there build the blank over there produce cell phone and then create the job for the people over there so now over there will be better than other provinces and as you see 75 percent of companies in vietnam are SME, uh, super SME. When I say super, maybe there are two people in the firms, or maybe five people in the firms, 95%. So due, due to the COVID-19, and then they want to help the SME owners. They just launched the uh, policy that 30% income tax will produce this year for the uh, SME companies in order to have the, uh, that, let's see, SME owner have the service in cash flow to, to improve their business. And then you see if the SME firm feel better, right? And then the people don't, don't get laid up. And then the social, society will be better. And then later on, they work and they improve the sales and then they pay the budget to the government. Thank you. Thank you. You, mean, you, you said 30% income tax has been allowed for SMBs? Is that correct? Pre zero. This year they, right. they did this income tax. What is the, what is the normal uh, income tax rate? 30% is the normal? It starts regular 20% and this year 30% of that means around 13%. That's one way. Regular 20%, but this year will be 13%, that's one three. So, so one three, okay, right. Okay. That help, that's help the strategy. to have the right. solar in cash flow. Right, Bill, thank you. It's a good strategy. You can discuss that uh, in a little yeah. more detail. <laughs> we come to Murali, your opening thoughts. Hi, uh, Lakesh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone who has joined. Uh, us on this panel to hear our thoughts on the inclusive growth. Um, as uh, Alakesh mentioned in introducing me, I am into the workforce development. Prior to that, I uh, used to run a software uh, engineering company out of uh, uh, Virginia, USA. So I have a bit of a technology background as well as a, uh, a, a, a social entrepreneurship background, uh, lack of a better word. Right? For me, especially in this COVID-19 um, phenomena, Lakesh, it, it saddens uh, me extremely given the millions of migrants, right, who, has been, who have been pushed um, out of the, uh, the, the corporate world, the metropolitan cities of India. And I, I think that has affected quite a bit of uh, um, both on the construction side, on the industrial side, and as well as the, the migrant worker side itself. So if there is a strategy which could be uh, allowed, and I, I think few of the states are now looking at uh, doing a skill mapping or a skill competency analysis of the local talent that is available in the various districts, in various panchayats, uh, especially in the states of uh, uh, Bihar and Uttar Pradesh, the uh, Jharkhand, where the migrant labor is of a higher magnitude. Um, uh, un see if we could allow the small and medium enterprises to foster in such areas, I think we could see a, a lot more inclusive growth. And I do uh, expect uh, the travel back of this migrant labor back to the, the cities where they are left. But I think it will take us at least about 12 to 15 months. Is That's my um, feeling. In this 12 to 15 months, if institutions like National Skill Development Corporation, Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, Ministry of Rural Development can come together and come with the schemes in which the inclusive growth uh, becomes a, a priority and agenda, uh, where workforce development becomes the, the key mantra, uh, I think we will see a, a huge strategy for the inclusive growth. Uh, that's where I would leave it for right now. And I would like to develop on more when we come around. Thank you, Murli. In fact, interesting thoughts. You know, one of the things that I always think about is if the migrant labor is being encouraged to stay back and not, you know, go back to the cities where they've come back from, 
what happens to the industry in the cities who need the migrant labor right so maybe that's a question we can take up during Absolutely. the discussion because there are a lot of like construction i was talking to a real estate company a couple of days ago and they were saying you know our migrant la- uh, our labor workforce that we need to build a building we are down to about 30% of what we need so we need about 1200 people we've got about 300 or 400 people right now with us so it is severely hampering those industries so we you know we keep talking about the ill effects of migration and the urban chaos that it causes but now we are beginning to realize that there are some benefits also to it there are lots of benefits to it and the fact that if these migrant labor actually don't go back to the cities it creates a new set of problems right Correct. so we'll come to that uh, i'll now come to sandeep sandeep uh, gulati your opening yes uh, alokesh so i i believe actually that the window and the opportunity for inclusive growth for india is probably the strongest at this point or you know it's it, are we almost getting there and, and the reason is that i sat as i mentioned a number of sessions today right and i saw in all the panels basically three teams emerged so it's not just an accident to topic or an our, our opinion and, and this basically firstly is there's consensus that you know the entire composition and the contributions to the india's gdp growth is actually skewed you know there is at least till the covid there was very large growth but the participation and the benefits are uneven secondly as dismal and uh, you know uh, terrible the covid has been the health consequences the casualties we seeing in many parts of the world but it is also a, a real uh, opportunity again for a reset or a redistribution at least a redistribution Of, of of activities in some way there there there, there is a rebuilding that's going to come whether we you know it's just fact of uh, life and and also what we've seen is that what's already started is perhaps the strongest policy response globally including in india you know it's a, both in terms of policy in terms of what's being done for the poorest of the poor and uh, and and with a fairly strategic orientation you know for a long time this had been a priority but but i i think the policies are now really geared to support it and and then the third part is you know which is in terms of as we reposition our our self reliance focus on rebuilding the uh, the infrastructure and i and i think for towards a sustainable future and, and as you mentioned in fact uh, murli uh, you know touched that that the whole uh, part of the reverse migration you know which which could be seen is as a terrible human problem let's not just deny that but 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 it has now created again you know what i call a a a ready workforce that the, which is already trained which is already working and can jump start and i'm sure it'll, it'll dovetail very uh, sort of in a, in the platform that alok is going to talk about it so what let's take just uh, you know a step back again and take the statistics so just we get a reality of, of what we're really dealing with here right the fact is that again despite our growth Our, our, our ranking on all the what I call the human development indices were very low, 128 out of 189. You know, we're low on the World Economic uh, Forum's Inclusion Index, the Social Progress Index. We're lowest in the BRIC. Those are terrible, terrible statistics. Given, 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 given the uh, the educated workforce we have and, and how entrepreneurial, you know, the, the generally the Indian uh, talent pool is. Uh, but, but those are real numbers. And I, I think the and and also what you know. what's made the disparity worse is, is is the distribution of the labor force right so if you look at it 70 to 80% of the actual labor force so far has been in what's called the informal economy it's it's a cliche but it's you know people working in these day to day jobs insecure with low productivity but most importantly there is no incentive for their employers to really train them right if the, even if if uh, you know folks like murli set up 100 centers you know somebody has to really be the the big champion in the mother than government putting money force in that yeah. and uh so so it, it is just 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 that this a large part of you know you have a labor force in this uh, in a in a in, informal economy you got reverse migration so suddenly you you got you know you got the human asset to jump start it and uh i think the other particular part is which is as the world map is redrawn the fact is that post covid the supply chain is going to be redrawn you know world is already moving towards 1 plus 1 window if it's going to be china the the big pole then there's a room for other countries it's a huge huge supply chain it's not a zero sum game there are a lot of room for number of players to come in and they will all over the world you know between latin america southeast asia africa but 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 the pie is large enough at, at least for india to again take a sizable and uh, you know disappointing if it doesn't 
So, so the supply chain and the logistics redefinition is, is and combined with this reimagining of these businesses. So, so it, it is again. I think things are ripe for inclusive growth. And the the one part that I would like to mention here is what I've seen in the U.S. You know, it's easy to say inclusive growth. We want the rural workforce to start train, start getting in high tech job, but somebody has to invest. Somebody can put the dollars, but the skill set really doesn't come in. And what I've seen in the U.S. is, for example, you know, supply chain is so important and so distributed, so large and complex. Boeing's of the world, Lockheed, GM, they invest tremendously in creating this massive supply chains. So a large part of the mentoring and the tech and the knowledge transfer and the people have actually come from large private enterprises. You don't have too many of public, right? And I think so. The, in India, what is again is there are large uh, private enterprises with huge public. And I, I, I think it's uh, you know the so one part which is not missing in the paradigm is these enterprises actually stepping in in the mentoring role. Somebody has to train them. So I'll conclude by saying I think as I see. There is an opportunity. The demographic mix is really right, and it's all about skills, skills, skills. The skills are going to drop from the sky. Somebody has, you know, it's really a skill strategy with government backing with infrastructure. So that's how I see it. Right. Thank you, Sandeep, for your opening thoughts. All very interesting thoughts, and you know, in terms of the supply chain, when you talk of global supply chains, I think China, like you rightly said, you know, is a major player in all sorts of global supply chains. And both Vietnam and India, you know, Bill is here, and we are all here, are also competing for large chunks of the global supply chain. Right. So how that ties into inclusive growth is something that we'll have to, you know, discuss. Uh, the, uh, the last speaker, uh, Nand Kishore, I'll come to you for your opening thoughts, and then we'll open up for some more questions. Thank you, Lokesh, and all other panelists. Um, uh, good evening from India. Uh, so uh, India is always a diversified country, and um, like all other panelists said. we have the best opportunity in front of us but again coming back to the uh, informal economy that is what worries us a lot it's not the first time the informal economy was on a hit uh, it was hit when the demonetization happened they were one of the most um, affected category same with the gst implementation they are the another uh, drawback happened for them uh, because gst directly impacted most of the business due to its pure implementation and now when it comes to uh, the same covid pandemic they are the one who most suffered and rightly as sandeep said I mean, no one has stepped in for upgrading their skills so most of us cry for not creating jobs because india's uh, youth population is really discontent with not creating jobs even though we are have we have many startups coming up every now and then we have startup missions across in, operating across the states but jobs are not being created so uh, i do believe even though government has multiple uh projects like the national skill development corporation there are no focused uh, initiatives to uh, really train this uh, workforce uh, to be more specific with uh, a small example like let's say uh, this uh, india has been adapting to the present pandemic situation because india became the second biggest uh, pp kit producer in this short while uh, after this uh, major issue has hit us uh, second to china but one issue like let's say most of this pp kit producing was about the labor force most of their labors were from other state and they had already gone back uh in i come from southern part in tamil nadu uh, they are one of the major producers of cotton mills they were all started working on supplying n99 mask but they again the reason hit them because they never had a workforce most of their workers from bengal or assam uh regionalizing or empowering individuals with uh, skills and uh, building business on the local resources is a, should be a priority for most of the governments uh, i think i would have to leave with that thought all right thank you i think uh, lo- skill development and uh, localization of opportunity i think is one of the uh, so, some of the clear uh, you know takeaways from the opening thoughts but uh, like bill was saying you know there's a Uh, income tax benefit for smbs and uh, vietnam is also a very uh, very dependent on farming and agriculture there's a lot of uh, agri uh, in vietnam right so bill maybe you can tell us a little more about you know uh, what is inclusive growth strategy in vietnam apart from the income tax for smbs is there anything else uh, happening there that you know the rest of us can also learn no. from no, no, now now the government um, Uh, want want to help SME in Vietnam and also what 
would like to invite investor come to Vietnam to do investment and then create more jobs for the people. If people have more jobs and the society will be safe and better, and then they have budget. So Ho Chi Minh City and uh, in the south, it really you, if you come here, we we need the de- technologies. I mean software and robots, and come here to produce to sell to local factory because uh, they they at the moment they don't have robots, and they need the robots in them. Okay, so I'll come to uh, Alok. You know, you were talking about a platform-based uh, entrepreneurship uh, model, platform-based model for inclusive growth. Can you elaborate a little on that? I'd like this discussion to focus more on solutions. You know, uh, that people can take away from here in terms of what can really be done on the ground to make a difference. So, uh, Alok, your thoughts. You know, you were mentioning something about a platform-based model. What is that, and how can that be implemented? Sure. Uh, uh, Thank you. So, I mean, as uh, other panelists have been saying, so there are two things which are necessary. I mean, obviously, one is capital and the other one is talent. And how do you get talent? That is through skill development. So when we are talking about platform and especially looking at India, and if you, so I've been working in Jharkhand. And if you look at Jharkhand per se, so there's Rachi and then, you know, the moment you go, 30, 40, 50 miles from Ranchi. So when you get to all these uh, uh, tribal areas, so there is no opportunity for the people. So what are they going to do? So it is not that Indian uh, rural India does not have the talent or the desire to do well. It is the lack of opportunity. So how can you get opportunity to people? So the way I see it, if we want to develop a platform, you need to do five key things. And so that is providing access to knowledge. So how do you train the people through skill development? And so there are a lot of different programs. So how can you have the partnership so that the people can can have knowledge? Then the second thing is talent. So how do so people in remote areas so they don't have access to to skill development? So how can you use NGOs and and universities like Utnan Bharat Abhiyan from in, in engineering institutions? So how can you get them the talent that is needed? Then the third thing is capital. So how can you get the capital? Although there are programs, but how can you make that available to them? Then the fourth thing is about technology. How can you get the technology to people? And the technology is, so if we are just focusing on uh, handicrafts and others looking at it as a craft, then obviously, you know, there are different villages, so they excel in certain things. But then what happens is that few people are much better skilled than the others. So all the products which are developed by few skilled people, they are going to, so they are going to to sell and all the others, they don't sell. And finally, access to the market. So when we are talking about a platform, so all these things have to happen. Mm -hmm. So we developed a concept called uh, manufacturing as a service. So where you have a, a manufacturing cloud, so from there, just like Uber, so all the orders get get to the cloud, so where they are actually aggregated and uh, and sorted, and then all these orders get distributed to individual entrepreneurs. So here, what we are we are attempting to do is to split uh, the the factory. So we have the capital, and then we have the labor, and both of them are entrepreneurs. And so the the factory can be on on wheels. So these factories can go to different places and then go to the entrepreneurs so who are providing the labor. And so the platform, the technology, what it does, it matches the production with the, with the labor. And then the order comes from the cloud, gets distributed to the, to the entrepreneurs, and then the factory comes to them just like Uber saying that you are going to have these four hours to work on it. And so the matching is done between the labor and 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 the and the platform and so that is that is how we can get the the resources especially the factory to be shared among a lot of different different communities so that way we can really enhance and 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 bring about the opportunities for people to work on higher end technologies so here if we do two things we really bring in the high end technologies to the people to work on on those technologies 
And so, so training and then the quality is done through risk polling. And the so way we... This, sorry, go ahead. Does this have to be led by a corporation? Like, because, you know, when we think of manufacturing, it is a plant focused, centralized kind of operation to gain the economies of scale. How would you gain economies of scale and yet meet, meet the efficiency? And let's say if you have a Six Sigma, you know, process that you're following, how do you make sure that all those uh, things are kept in place and maintained? And do you get economies of scale from the model that you're speaking about? Absolutely. So here the economies of scales are coming through the, through the networking. So you can have a network of these factories on wheels. So depending, so, so here, you know, we are just flipping the model. So if you look at any of the stationary factories, so here the resources are, are given. And so, so what you're doing, you're optimizing on the utilization of the resources. So here we are flipping the problem. So here the capacity itself is dynamic. So depending upon upon the, the demand, so what you can do is you can requisition more and more resources. So you are optimizing. So, so given the, the quality requirements and given the, the due date, so what you do is given those things, so now you optimize the capacity. And then you can right. distribute. So what you're doing is you are bringing in the production at the bottom of the pyramid, and then you are taking the production closest to where the demand is. So if there is a, a retailer, so let's say Walmart or, or Flipkart or someone else wants something developed, so let's say say some, some furniture, then you identify the closest community which is which has the skills to produce furnitures. So then you 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 send the push the order down to that community and then move the factories, produce it and deliver directly. So what you're doing is you're really compressing the compressing the 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 uh, the lead time from production to to sales so it becomes a lot more dynamic a lot more more responsive to the market and and the demands so so that so is the goal is of like this it model has, uh, it's a very very interesting concept the only thing i can think about is it has a lot of moving parts and you need to like you rightly said you need a lot of technology to be able to tie these things together mm-hmm. you know and yet remain united in purpose so I will bring this point to Murli, you know, uh, you, for example, you're in skill development. So one part of the capital, the yeah. skills, the talent, labor yeah. and the other things that you spoke of, you know, you are in the skill development area. So, uh, you know, uh, Alok spoke about uh, Jharkhand and uh, those places where uh, it's difficult to get this thing moving. Do you think this kind of a platform based distributed kind of manufacturing through cloud? Is it something that can be implemented? Is it being done? Do you see possibilities of it happening? Where will the capital come from? Uh, your views? I doubt it, Alakesh. I really, I mean, so, I mean, with all, uh, I'm, I'm, all my respects and uh, uh, this thing to, uh, uh, you know, but uh, uh, as Alok mentioned, see, I, for some reason, there's a disconnect between what uh, a practitioner would want and what is on the, on the ground reality, what, uh, the human resources would want, right? For example, um, I had a skill center in Jharkhand. We were working uh, with the Jharkhand, uh, you know, uh, Urban Development Authority uh, to enhance the Ministry of Rural Development DDUGKY skill program. But pretty much our skill programs were targeted towards a blue collar workforce because the way the government schemes, everything was linked towards how can we enhance the uh, you know, the foreign remittances of the labor can can they go work as a plumber? Can they go work as a carpenter? Can they go work as a uh, electrician? Right? Can they come to uh, Bangalore? Can they come to Hyderabad work as a facility manager? And also the people who are there, they are also very very clear what they want. If they can earn about twelve thousand to fifteen thousand rupees a month, they are quite happy. Here, so there are you are. Are talking more from a micro entrepreneur point of view rather than being part of a ma- major you know manufacturing operation is that, that right is that more the model here that, so that is not the model see that is a model which we would like to be where we would want them to be part of a larger mission larger corporation larger manufacturing hub but from an individual point of view his or her needs are very very limited they we, we are trying to force fit an entrepreneurial model when they themselves are not entrepreneurs. See, you want them to be entrepreneurs, but their mindset is not entrepreneurial. So again, that is where a slow... So this is where I call, talk about the... So what is the solution there for, you know, uh, the labor who are coming back to... Exactly. I'm coming there. See, 
there is a, 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 a transgression or a, uh, a transformation which has happened in the Indian economy from an economy of scarcity to economy of containment to economy of abundance. People like you, me, we're all in the economies of abundance, right? Whereas people who are in the rural areas, they're still in the economy of scarcity. So first and foremost, what we need to do is how do we fulfill that economy of scarcity? And this is what I call it as a we need to remove the friction of employment. How can I remove the friction of employment from their mindset? So if I tell them you come and take a training for two months and still we have we might be able to help you find a job instead of might. I am going to give you a job today. I'm going to start start your paycheck today with 2000 rupees or 3000 rupees. But after two months of training, your paycheck becomes 8000 rupees or 10,000 rupees because you have now become a, a certified whatever the job role is. It could be as simple as a digital marketeer from a, a three tier uh, engineering college or a, a facility manager uh, or a facility management person uh, from a, a three tier village. If I can become an employer of records and then remove the friction, right? Or, uh, then there is a removal of friction from the education aspect of it. There are two things which are there in this area. One is an education friction. One is an employment friction. If someone can remove these two things, then automatically you, you see the skill enhancement happening. So um, as everyone on this panel mentioned, skilling is the most important and priority thing. How do you right. make that as an so, enhancement? Thank you, uh, San, you know, Morley. I'll come to Sandeep. You know, we are having a slightly differing views on this. And you are a serial entrepreneur. You have founded several businesses, you know, uh, on your own. You have handled these issues yourself. So, Sandeep, you tell us your view on uh, on this issue of, uh, you know, is it really employment that we want to stress on or is it entrepreneurship that we want to stress on? And in uh, both I think models, I make, uh, interesting two comments. By the way, uh, you know, if I s just step back and I listen, both are heading to the same goal. Alok and, uh, you know, uh, Murli are not that far apart. different right? parts for the same goal. It's a, and, and, and also it goes to the question. So uh, just to, to and, and here's what I want to say. Firstly, I am an absolute believer in, you know, the concept of factory on wheels or having a platform and, and distributor. Now, the person in computer science, we've seen what the power of distributed computing has been done, right? We move from owning everything to data centers to cloud, and we've seen it transform the entire digital economy. That that we have security also. right? But but I, I think what is also interesting is that uh, you know the cloud is the most common thing we talk every day now. But in yeah. terms of distributed manufacturing in the West and in a lot of the places, the supply chains I talk about it, they are nothing but very distributed development processes. Actually, the entire process has been mapped onto organization with specific competencies one flowing to the other to the other okay and, and the th but the key point is and this is really right if you want to be inclusive you could take uh, and it will take time but you could take a hundred years educate a generation which will educate the generation we'll build the infrastructure ground up right or you could push some of the infrastructure to the places where there are people available now the thing that is most interesting looking outside in and a product of the same culture is, is that Indians are basically very tech savvy. You know, the way they've taken to the smartphones across the spectrum, regardless of, of social, gender, uh, e economic status, they've completely embraced it from banking. I and mean, it's a huge success, right? It's just a tremendous tool of empowerment. So, so, so the, I, I think also a large, you know, there are the two parts of the labor class. A lot of the labor is actually skilled. They were working in factories. They, you know, not all of them were in construction. Not all of them were towing bricks but but they so 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 if you so you do have a, a skilled labor a force which is coming from rural tier two tier three tier four cities right so getting a platform to them would absolutely you know would be one way to go once you get the platform they need the training and i think but it provides a focus for skilling it, it is if murli who's a like you know what i call an educator knew he has to train 50 people for the particular skill. He knows where to shepherd the resources, the teachers who would get them the right skills so they can work in those factories, right? But 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 I, I think having the platform, what the platform can do really sets the requirement for the skill. As I said, when you build a plane, you do need a requirement, right? You've got to have the chicken or the egg, but we can keep arguing it. 
or the requirement, you know, the, so it's, it's an easy, finite way for the requirement to be driven from the platform. The, sec, the one part I did want to add is, I, I think in terms of the opportunity, there's another strategic orientation, which is every country, if you look at Japan to China, even to the US, and I've seen, you know, each country has a strategic policy, basically choosing stretch, uh, what I call applications or technologies or things that are really right, right? So if you look at it, I think what most people miss is India is also a huge importer of things it could easily make in the country, right? Fertilizers, petrochemicals, you know, with 3D printing. So the fact is there's an entire list of items which we are now importing, which this labor could do. So you have a problem set, which means you have well-defined markets for consumption in, in India to start with. The fact that we're importing, they also globally, you know, they apply to a lot of the world. So it's really a marriage of, of the platform the skilling, the, you know, basically skilling to the platform, but choosing the industries and the targets strategically, where if for no other reason you're at least cutting down on the on your importing, you know, you you know, the whole world wants to come to India because of this bottom to you know bottom of the pyramid market size, right? So you got a market already there. So Fortune at the bottom of the pyramid is something new, and you know, it's really very very exciting and interesting to note. And uh, I'll come to you know you Nand Kishore, and you are you know. When Sandeep says that we need more people, we have too many things importing that we can actually make here. We are depending on people like you, you know, the startups, the new generation, the new, uh, you know, business people. Uh, you are into cybersecurity and, uh, you know, there are many others in your home state, Kerala, where uh, the startup scene is beginning to look very interesting. What is the kind of feel that you get in terms of, uh, because startups and entrepreneurships, you know, entrepreneurs, they can make a huge difference to inclusive growth, right? I mean, they can start their businesses anywhere. They can hire people in their local areas and that can also spur growth, right? So what are you, what are you seeing in terms of the startup growth in, in your state? Uh, Kerala is a good example of uh, a startup hub uh, because Kerala has something called a Kerala startup mission. Uh, which empowers uh, startups like, let's say, uh, you can be from any state, but you can register with the Kerala Startup Mission. Then you can bid for government project. Maybe that is a good window what we are seeing. Uh, like, let's say, any latest project that is happening in Kerala is highly backed by government. Uh, they have their own facilities to empower startups. One aspect is that almost 75% of the startups in Kerala are based out of Trivandrum, Cochin, and Calicut. But on the other side, uh, there are almost 25 percent of the startups are still existing in the rural areas uh, and the Kerala government has been establishing IT parks not just in city focus but also rural areas like let's say uh, from Cochin uh, I mean if you travel 20 kilometers to both Trivandrum side and uh, Calicut side you could see IT parks coming in rural areas so uh, Kerala has a bit stepped up in its startup culture uh, because Kerala is one of the biggest survival is the IT industry because uh, most of the organizations like TCS or Infosys have their campuses in massive campuses in Kerala. And it, it's still, uh, remember, I mean, like re, uh, depending on that kind of a market. Mm. And uh, right. yeah. OK, thanks. Actually, we are almost out of time. I wish yeah, you know, okay. how, how it flies. We don't even realize. But, you know, there was one very strong point made. And I'll ask just a quick question to each one of you, which is, you know, we spoke Sandeep particularly and even the other panelists we mentioned that this is a opportunity for rebuilding right it's a reset of our economies reset of activities it is an opportunity more than a disaster if you look at it uh, with that lens so if i were to ask each one of you what is the first thing if you're talking of reset of our activities reset of economy what is the first thing that you think should be addressed quickly all five start uh, with alok yeah I, I think you know you know we have to give opportunities to to the grassroots and that is the only way to transform. So we have to reimagine our whole business model because if every person in the world lived like the average American, it will require resources of four planets. So we have to reimagine the way we, we, we develop. Correct. Bill, your thought? I think of collaborations because it can be, they have uh, a community advantage, uh, advantages. So collaborations. Okay. Uh, real stimulus from the government, uh, not the real stimulus. Yeah. yeah uh, the, 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 what really yes. matters the money transferred to the uh, right. at the bottom of the pyramid for the inclusive growth to happen. Right, Sandeep. I think I'll I'll use the point you made earlier, uh, and it's also what Burli was saying, but I didn't quite finish it. 
I think it's got to be strategically looked as creating a stable employment. The, 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 in order to get inclusivity from everything as I understand about the, you know, it's the, the technology, the platform, the opportunity, the window, everything is there, but it's got to be managed from the lens of how does it start creating stable employment? Because that's, I think, what can get the wheels really moving. Right. And drive okay, it. Sure. Uh, I believe Atmanirbhar Bharat should really reach to the Atma of India, to the real desert once it would go to the ground level. Okay, you need to translate that for Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so what he's saying is that self-reliant India has to get into the soul of India. You know, you'll have to look at the grassroots and we have to address the grassroots. It's been an absolute pleasure, gentlemen. You know, thank you so much for joining this panel. You know, the time flew faster. I think we were just about warming up. We needed another at least one and a half hours to really discuss this. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have that luxury. But very interesting thoughts. I'm sure the audience will also take away uh, some interesting takeaways to go and actually start thinking about and making a difference to how uh, they work and plan. And hopefully our panel today can influence some change in behavior uh, in terms of how we manage things. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.